welcome to The Way Back, a discussion of the film and TV industry in the COVID-19 era. This series is presented by Greenslate and produced by the Catch a Break podcast. I'm Julie Harris-Walker, the SVP of West Coast Operations at Greenslate and the host for the Catch a Break podcast. So after taking a pause last week, we are here to talk about getting production back up and running. We share your desire to get back to the work of production and we look forward to our discussion today on the latest information in our COVID-19 live series. But before we start, I'd like to express our hope that when we return, we do so with intent, purpose, and action that is shaped by the events happening now. Green Slate and Catch a Break podcast continue to stand in solidarity with everyone in the Black community. The Catch a Break podcast was started as a comprehensive tool on how to break into and navigate the entertainment industry in an effort to create the knowledge and the access that will lead to inclusion and robust representation. And we're planning a future conversation about how we can directly address the lack of diversity both behind and in front of the camera and how to create workplaces where everyone <clears throat> is valued and safe. We're going to reach out with details as soon as they're available and we hope that you will join us for that discussion as well. But today is the second in the series of our four conversations we're going to have about working in the age of COVID-19. Today the focus is on how vendors are pivoting or are already positioned to work in the COVID-19 era. Everything has changed. There are new protocols for safety and cleanliness. There is finally a renewed focus on digital administrative solutions, and we anticipate an uptick in visual effects. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Hugh Carvley is the CEO and co-founder of Moxian. It's like dailies, but a day earlier. He was obsessed with how technology can help the filmmaking process. He's been driving innovation in the entertainment industry since co-founding Liquid Edge, which is New Zealand's high-tech startup of the year in the early noughties followed by three more successful and innovative business startups, The Rebel Fleet, Rush Hour, and Moxian. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you. Michael Elliott is the CEO of Coyote Studios, the market leader in top-notch studio and production services, including stages, production vehicles, equipment, and expendables. He started the business driving commercial photographers to shoots in his custom-designed motorhome, and then he created the highly successful production services company in 1995 with fellow UCLA English major Jordan Katane. Coyote Studios employs over 250 people in LA, New York, New Orleans, and Atlanta with over a million square feet of studios, vehicle parking, and warehouse space. Michael is a creative risk taker and fun loving individual who in his spare time loves reading, surfing, snowboarding, and playing with his three young kids. Hi, Michael. Hello. I wanted to say, and long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Leifad is the VP of Sales and New Business Development at Greenslate. Prior to that, she was from the world of factual, unscripted entertainment as the Senior Account Manager at Real Screen. While she has spent the last few years encouraging productions to go paperless across the US, she is currently working on expanding Greenslate's paperless workflow to Canada. Welcome, Carrie. Hi. Full disclosure, Greenslate uh, is sponsoring this and Carrie and I work together. Sarah McGrail is the director of VFX sales at Picture Shop. Sarah has worked as a visual effects producer on over 60 acclaimed television series and feature films. She is on the Visual Effects Society LA board, an executive member of Women in Film, an active member of the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences, Hollywood Post Alliance, and the Producers Guild of America. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, welcome. John Gillespie is the executive mm -hmm. president of operations at Cache Entertainment. <clears throat> in this capacity, he's the senior liaison to the production accounting community and has extensive experience in all production accounting, tax incentives, and finance matters. Prior to his tenure at Cache, Sean worked at Entertainment Partners as the director of production incentive administration and finance. And his 17 years of production accounting experience includes working for major studios on a number of high profile films, including Titanic, Evan <laughs> Almighty, and Sweet Home Alabama, just to name a few. Additionally, Sean was the manager of production finance for HBO during the era of The Sopranos and Six Feet Under, where, fun fact, he also provided me with a Danish every morning of my first pregnancy, resulting in a significant weight gain that I am holding against him to this very day. Even but you were happy. <laughs> <laughs> fun fact. Knowledge, and I'm still holding it against you, Sean. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. 
So as we jump in, this is a panel and a podcast, so we're going to try to be as confirma uh, confirmational, conversational as this format will allow. So if you are in Zoom or on Facebook, and I think we're at more than capacity for Zoom, so it may have bumped you over to the Facebook Live. So wherever you are, we want to collect your questions. Also, we want this to be um, conversational with you as well. So whatever format you're watching on, put your questions in the comment section, and we're going to collect them, and they're going to send them to me, and we'll answer as many as time allows. All right, is everybody ready? We're gonna start with Michael. Job one is to open up sets and stages and ensure the safety of the crew and cast. I know that you have been obsessed with this and working on a bunch of things. So why don't you start and tell us what you're doing? Oh, okay, so we uh, we started the SAFE set uh, initiative. We, uh, we had a, we'd done something in the past with SAFE sets sort of a spent to sort of take off a safe sex. So I felt like that we could own this sort of moniker safe set, right? And uh, for us, it includes everything from sort of uh, our, our, our transportation, all of our vehicles, our stages, all of our equipment businesses. And then on our store, studio store, we're selling all of the, the PPE stuff. So uh, it sort of started, let's sort of start with the stages. Uh, we got mobile, cleaning stations or sanitation stations, you know, on every stage. Um, uh, we're, you know, they, we, they, every, we got additional janitorial uh, for, you know, we have the higher up. And so we're doing that right now. We got basically an after hours crew, like coming in there after every shoot day to sort of disinfect the space, getting it ready for the next day. Uh, we have, we got these, we bought these, these sort of, these guns, these UOV sprayers that spray big areas of, of the, of the stage. So you can go in there after shooting, and really disinfect the whole thing and make sure all the countertops, you know, sort of the high touch areas. So I get the makeup rooms, uh, the bathrooms get like, they, with the sprayer, it looks like a little, like a Ghostbusters with a little backpack and you just sort of spray big areas of stages and bathrooms and these sort of common areas. So that's kind of uh, what we're doing on, on, this, on the stage side. Um, you know, that, that I'll say in the makeup room, the, let's call it, well, let's go to the trailer transport side. Our makeup trailers have plexiglass sort of dividers between, you know, you might have an eight or nine station. They used to have them line them up, eight to 10 really. But now it's gonna probably be three or four Per makeup trailer, right? With these plexi dividers, it means more trailer rentals for us. But um, um, yeah, probably, actually, our, our trailer division is probably going to be do quite well because I think people are going to really want to isolate. And uh, so we've had to do that. And, and on the trailer side, we when we disinfect it at night, we got to put like um, like a seal on it, right? So it's like sanitize when, and then they sort of pop the seal the next day, so they know no one has been in there since they've got in there. Yeah. So, um, uh, so the, the that's some of the stuff we're doing. We came up with this uh, this clean cart idea, and so we built like uh, like a, a cart with the big beefy wheels on it, where it had um, the back to back sinks, and it had the uh, motion detected you know, uh, uh, sanitizer on. So that's a uh, and it has all the PPE stuff inside of it. So with a little light on it, so you'll see those in the stages everywhere and they're for rental on location too. And if you need to take them out to, uh, you know, I don't know, on location where it's into a, a desert area, they've got sort of the pneumatic tires on them so you can get them into a different areas. So you you have a hand washing station so like near to set. Uh, um, and as I said, our store is uh, selling everything. If you go to our, our expendables.com, um, you can see all, all the PPE that we're selling from, from the gloves to the, the masks, all the different uh, 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 to, uh, disinfectants, all that kind of stuff's up there. So um, we're, we're just really trying to make sure, like you, you, you wanna make sure that when people come back, they feel safe and comfortable and confident. And, and we're gonna sort of adhere to all that, you know, the white paper that came out. So any of the union protocol and industry protocols will be following that. Any, uh, all the check-ins that were sort of like either equipment or um, 
or, or vehicles will so all be paperless check in and check out. So no, no handoff of, of paper anymore. So what else are we doing? Uh, oh, we're so one thing for our, our employees before we come back. Yeah, we're going to test all of our employees uh, for COVID, and they'll periodically get tested again. And uh, we came up with this: uh, this every employee has to we get it. Everyone gets a text every morning. It's the Coyote self certification, right? There's a four or five questions that basically say ask if you been in touch, do you, do you know if any, have you been in contact with someone who had COVID, do you have symptoms, and then their managers get notified whether or not, um, if they, if there's any kind of a yes, that basically they don't come to work, right, if there's, so there's a list, so managers get a list of who's, who's good to go or not for every day, so they go through a quick self-certification every day before they come to work. Well, it sounds like you figured out so many of the pieces, and I think I hear a collective sigh of relief from producers who are thinking, where am I going to source all this stuff? You've already figured out and sourced it. Yeah, well, yeah. That's great. I love the idea of the clean card. I saw that video of your yeah. little station. I think that's so smart to be able to wash your hands right there and get whatever PPE you need, like, and roll it around the set. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we actually did that in, in um, we have some art department buddies who are actually manufacturing for th those for us. So it was a collaboration with another another uh, uh, design company, production design company in town. I'm also hearing cha-ching, 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 as you're saying all these things about people having to figure out yeah. the COVID line in the budget. Yeah. And you, you can help people with that, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is going to cost us, it's going to cost us money to disinfect all the stuff and, you know, sanitize these different facilities and the old equipment and vehicles. So production is probably going to have to bear a bit of that expense in terms of, you know, cleaning fees for stages, a little, little, little more, a little more of it than they, than they were accustomed to prior to COVID. And it sounds like renting more trucks than you normally would. That's right. That too. A lot of moving. Yes, back. yes, there would be. We've already gotten quite a few requests for a lot of more trailers per show than than before. Uh, to really, you know, depending on uh, individuals' comfort levels, you know, the in terms of isolating different uh, individuals or or um, even even different types of crew, you know. That's great. Okay, Hugh, I'm going to move over to you. Tell us about Moxie and. and I don't, I don't know that you pivoted for COVID. I think you were set up initially to <laughs> really be thriving in this environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so first, hi everyone. I'll, um, I'll give you a little background on, on what we do. So uh, we, were, we were doing dailies and then we introduced a product called Immediates, which does accelerated dailies. And it enables everyone on a production to see the, see the footage shot by the cameras seconds after they finish recording and, and they can view this in a browser an iphone ipad apple tv etc and so like you said julie um we say immediate so like dailies but a day earlier and uh to give you an example of where we were headed with this before um COVID, um happened um uh, a good example is that on um on disney's dumbo um pickups uh, the director tim burton they didn't have to travel from LA back to the UK to, to reshoot them or to, to shoot the pickup. So he, he stayed in LA with the editor and he was directing using a live stream back to the UK. So, you know, pan left, tilt up, um, and then using our immediates within um, a few minutes, the, the footage that he had just directed uh, remotely in the UK had been uploaded from the set. We had transcoded it into an avid friendly format for the edit that would be dropped into the edit uh, in LA and he could see in the context of the edit what he'd just directed. Um, and we can also do the reverse. So we can, we can upload the cut of the edit um, you know, created using footage that was shot you know, on set just an hour ago and we can send that back. We can send that back to set uh, for playback on the on-set monitors. So you get that nice sort of collaboration happening between on set and and post and uh, and this this ability for um people anywhere in the world to have almost instant virtual access to 
footage shot on set is, is very useful in, in these times. And I, I guess, you know, what, what we're seeing now is that people are forming protective bubbles um, around the production. So you have you know, a bubble for the camera crew, the talent, uh, the creatives, post, etc. And, and this kind of technology helps all these bubbles to, to access the footage. They need to do their jobs without, without having to physically be in contact with each other. Um, and I, I, a good example of this is um, in post. Um, well, as you know, these, these days posters no longer really post. It, it almost happens at the same time as production. It, um, maybe it be, should be called concurrent or something. It hasn't got quite the same ring, but mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know what I mean. Um, and so, for example, you know, we're, we're seeing immediates enable the post uh, VFX supervisor um, uh, who, who yeah, enables them to feedback on set with an almost real time without actually having to risk being on set. Um, so, yeah, so th these are the kind of ways we're, we're helping out in these, these times of COVID. Well, it sounds like you're doing away with Video Village. Well, I, th I think Video Village, um, it, it can still be there, but the mm. people that would normally access the Video Village, they don't have to come on set to do that. So I guess it's been extended. Yes, yeah, so you can watch it on your phone. From yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If there's I, I think, a back table? Yeah, I was just going to say, so I, th I think the core crew on set would still find the Video Village very, very useful. But for people who would normally you know, wander onto set, reference something, uh, have the video assist play them something back for reference. They no longer need to, to risk going on set to do that. Great, thank you. So Sarah, I think that's a good segue to you. There's a lot of chatter about, you know, we have no humans anymore, just visual effects. I'm sure that's not what's gonna happen, but I imagine that your scope is gonna be broader. Why don't you tell us about what you're seeing and hearing? Yeah, I mean, at a right now at a facility level, visual effects facilities are uh, making sure that they're prepared uh, with temperature checks. What are their limited on-site options going to be for clients? Uh, and really, the artists are set up. Um, a lot of facilities in our team um, within a week was able to move a lot of our artists to at home and secure remote work, uh, which is going to be something that is going to probably continue for a lot of artists. Um, and it's also nice to have some flexibility with different locations. Um, that's something else that's coming into play for a lot of vendors where we have an LA team. Uh, we also have like Ghost VFX in Copenhagen where you can kind of manage overflow because as this pandemic is hitting the whole world, um, it's helpful to have teams in different locations with different laws and different abilities. And um, so if one area is hit harder, there may be other options. Um, so that's one consideration. Uh, as far as on set, we're having a lot of conversations with productions right now, and it's a great time currently to get budgets in place and start thinking through based on your script, based on what production plans are, um, what things you can be thinking about. And a lot of it is what limitations as far as uh, distancing, social distancing for actors. Mm -hmm. um, crowd replication is a very big concern. Um, if you have people up close, you know, that's where you maybe end up doing kind of a 2D compositing where you shoot multiple takes and you can kind of, you can put them all together. Um, so you may need to have a locked off camera uh, or motion control rings are gonna be a very hot property <laughs> in the days ahead. Um, because we've been doing, you know, you have twin movies where you shoot something once with a stand in and then you swap it out and put the actor in and then you can composite it in visual effects with the twins together. And those are usually done with lock off cameras or motion control rigs. Um, so that's something we do all the time. Uh, crowd tiling is when you, you, know, you have a little pod of people, maybe 10 people, and you shoot them in different setups or they switch out some clothing and you composite them all together. Those things are very, you know, they're done all the time. Um, it's just making sure that if you haven't budgeted to that in the past, every time you, look, you see that in the background, um, you start thinking, oh, that's going to cost me, you know, $10,000, <laughs> you know, and you just start planning those into your scenes. Uh, and now is a great time to reach out to the FX facilities, producers, and start getting those costs in mind. Um, even if they're really hard to predict, you can at least get some ballparks. Um, so that's for kind of the up-close scenes. I think for the really distant stuff, you get into CG crowds, um, where there's some effects software, uh, Massive, or we use Gollum, uh, where you have 
you know, the kind of the huge crowds that we're used to seeing going into battle in various movies. Um, you know, that's also something that can be done, but it takes a little bit more time to piece in what your actors look like. So you may have zombies ready, <laughs> you know, with the right animation cycles, and you, but you might need just people milling about on a New York street or doing something very specific. Um, so it's, it's really case by case, and that's a little bit what's different for visual effects versus some other post-production. You can't really lock in a cost and sort of say, okay, this is always going to be this much. Um, every shot is sort of a unique butterfly <laughs> in visual effects. And so it really does take, you know, trying to go through a script and talk through what options are. We've done a lot of bids where we're sort of doing an estimate for a uh, traditional estimate for the visual effects. And then we'll do sort of a COVID kicker bid um, that has, these are all the other things you might want, it could happen. This is sort of the, you know, maybe the worst case. Um, production might be able to work around these things. Uh, maybe there just isn't the budget to deal with additional composites or CG crowds. And so you may want to plan for, you know, doing that in production. And if it doesn't work or if you end up saying, you know what, we do want to do the visual effects, at least then you know that's going to be $100,000 that we may have to find or whatever that total might end up being. Um, but, the, the, you know, part of it is budgeting and cost and also turnaround. So just, you know, visual effects houses really do – go as quick as they can, <laughs> but as our, you know, the budgets and also the time frames have really been pulled up, um, and that's, it's never going to stop. I think <laughs> at some point we'll have instantaneous buttons for everything, um, but in the meantime, I think, you know, also having a realistic idea of, you know, what to render that is going to take a week, so you need to have at least that much time built in if we're going to change modes on something. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about crowds, um, set extensions is another, another thing where, you know, you, maybe your actor, your lead doesn't want to travel. And so something you had set in another part of the world or you had locations for now is getting pulled back to LA. Uh, personally, I'm biased and I love LA production. So <laughs> I love things that are here. Um, but it's nice to, to have some flexibility and say, well, you can put in digital environments. Um, I know virtual production is a very hot topic. Uh, I, with Mandalorian, people are, are starting to be very familiar with what that may look like. Um, but there's everything from a full green screen stage where you put in a pre-rendered background to LED panels with stars out a starship window to the kind of full environments with LED screens that are real time that they use for Mandalorian. So it has a lot of different flavors. Um, and you can sort of build that into really any kind of show. You just need to talk through it on the front end because it's very collaborative. So you may have, you know, 10 vendors you have to bring in to achieve something like Mandalorian versus, you know, if you have a 30 minute comedy and you just want to have a CG neighborhood put out there. I mean, we do that for a show and you're trying to figure out how do I, how can I possibly do this over a season? Uh, we're prepared to say, okay, let's, create, you know, an asset for the neighborhood and something we can amortize and make work so that it's more cost effective and it can still be achieved even if it's a very kind of short, you know, time frame, a traditional sort of broadcast schedule. So we're getting ahead on those, <laughs> excuse me, those areas. Uh, and beauty is always, you know, it's sort of this, now that we're shooting 4K, 6K, uh, 8K and anamorphics, <laughs> all these things are um they're very high detail hdr it doesn't do anyone any favors on that front and if you maybe they don't you know actors may not be comfortable having a lot of makeup time in the mornings and it might be just quicker to do some beauty fixes on the back end so that's something we also handle um you know hundreds of shots sometimes for, for shows traditionally um it's just a, a very common thing it's quick and easy to do so we're, we're very prepared for that kind of thing as it starts ramping up it seems like so much of actors' worlds are going to have to change. Besides the whole makeup of it all and not standing near each other, like they may have to come up. I imagine there's some training that has to go with how do you act if, it, if everything is visual effects. It's a whole different craft. Can yeah, you it's amazing. You know, <laughs> like, are those, those scenes happening anymore? You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what people are going to do. Yeah. Well, that's, like we're used to seeing like the person touch a shoulder or ride on a dragon or sort of these 
you know, their interactions, but they're somewhat limited. So there's been a big question of on like an intimacy scene, you know, how much interaction is happening? Can you just have people in like green sleeves and just do it all in post? Um, and I think the answer to that is uh, anything's possible with enough time and money. <laughs> but, um, you know, for some of those, I think there's a reality of it. There's really close and specific interaction. I think you have to have that, that two people. There's something about having people together in that same space. I don't know how actors do it. It's incredible. So, <laughs> um, you know, to, to have that, I think, still has so much value. They do so much work, and to have real extras in adds so much to it. So I think our hope is to do as much practically as possible and then to just fill in where we need to. Yeah. Okay. I'm also hearing cha-ching, 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 and people need to call you in the very early days of this. And then speaking of the cha-ching, cha-ching, um, I think you should probably be working with Hugh so that you can be talking to people as they do their shots to say, fix that now, because to fix it in post is going to be an extra $100,000. Why don't you take another take instead? Yeah, absolutely. To have that real time, you know, like to be able to see dailies and to get that as quickly as possible to say, you know, I, you know what, we planned on two shots or a lock off and I see that's not should have been shot that way. So we should just talk about what that could mean, depending on when you, what, what choices are made. Editing. I mean, it's not our job to, you know, to edit it or to make those, those decisions, but just to provide information and support and try to help achieve that vision. Yeah, yeah. And, and also what we saw, um, Sarah, on some of the shoots where people were using immediates for um, VFX is that they were able to do almost like a, a, a running budget of, of the day's shoot. So by the end of the day, they could tell production how much that day was going to cost from, from VFX. Oh, I hear that account, a whole new line in your hot cost. <laughs> okay, let's move over to uh, the office. Now, Carrie, I'm going to move to you. Like, I know now I don't want to open my mail. I don't want to put away my groceries. I certainly don't want to be in an office with a stack of paper sitting next to someone where I have to approve a bunch of stuff and sign a bunch of stuff. So I know that Greenslate is prepared to handle that. So why don't you tell us all about it? Well, Am I the only one here that's also taking the disinfecting wipes and then wiping down the disinfecting container? I mean, nobody wants to touch anything anymore. And I, I mean, it's better to be safe than sorry, go completely paperless. And you know, the good news is, is that Greenslate does have the technology to make your production office 100% paperless. We have everything from digital start work, digital time cards and production accounting software. So, you know, we've got digital signatures, so there's no handing over of any papers. And, you know, it's, it really helps streamline your office and, um, and it gives your production office less to worry about. I mean, your employees are now basically self-serving because they can access all their tax documentation, all their pay stubs on our portal. Um, and it's also a time where everyone's on their cell phones, right? So yes, you can access things on your desktop, but everything that we do have within our software is also available on mobile, whether it be Apple or Android, we've got apps native to both. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people have been really pushing the digital movement for a long time. And it's just kind of crazy that there are still people trying to hold things back because people are used to things being a certain way in this industry. And we totally get it. We always say, hey, we're flexible. Let's do it how you like it. But in COVID times, it's really going to push people to go paperless and go digital. And I mean, on the flip side, yes, it's great to go digital because it's good for the environment or, um, or it's going to make your life easier. But at the end of the day, it's also about the bottom line. I mean, we're all talking here about all these additional services and things that we need to think about, you know, with disinfecting this, taking care of these bubbles and, and making sure that everyone's safe on set. Um, going digital also means you're saving yourself money. I mean, think of all the money you're spending on the storage fees, the bankers boxes, or how about that one person you have hired that their sole job is to just scan document after document for days and honestly sometimes months on some productions which is just absolutely mind-blowing to someone like me who works for a technology-based company. Um, we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of other disruptors in this industry like 
Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, just to name a few uh, companies that I think share the same wavelength we here at Greenslate have. Um, so it's something to think about. If you want to look also at the big picture, something great for studios to think about in terms of also saving money is we have a, a production dashboard where you can see all of your shows all in one place, how far along in their budgets they are. Um, you could be like, hey, could you, you know, flag these shows once they hit 90% of their budget so we can then make alterations on some other shows and shift the budgets around. Um, and if you happen to be a new producer or a production accountant looking to, to get into the business some more, I think it's a really great time to familiarize yourself with the software and get yourself into that mindset that a lot of these other companies are in because if you want to work with them they're going to say hey you got to be you got to be able to work with these people thank you carrie and i know like being in the payroll space we've been talking to clients for years and pushing digital 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 and everyone's been like i'm never gonna get the guy on the truck with the paper to do the digital do it on their smartphone and it just feels like we've hit critical mass like raise your hand if you don't have a smartphone i think we can get there and it, it will be great to see like who's first out of the gate to commit to digital end to end no paper we're doing this it really takes a top down commitment from a company approach. It's exciting to see. So Sean, we work with you as well. What is Cash? Absolutely. Cashier? Well, thank you very much for inviting me today. You know, I was thinking this is the first time in our 20 plus years of friendship that we've actually done anything like this. So thank you very much for including me. I mean, we've done it uh, over brunch, but this is different. Right, brunch, dinner, but never this. We've been getting a lot of requests from our clients to see how we could take cache to be totally paperless. They want to dramatically reduce the amount of paper they're touching, which we all know why, because of post COVID-19. So we um, have made some enhancements to some of our current products and we have a new product that we're rolling out called cache pay that I'm very excited about. Uh, I don't know if any of you know this, but we have a mobile app that's available on Apple and Google Play where the cardholders can actually download the app and when they're out shopping, they can now take pictures of the receipts, upload it to our cache portal, and when they're in the system reconciling their transactions, they can attach those receipts to those transactions. So it's doing away with having to, you know, print out the top sheet then add the receipt to it and then send it around for signature. So we're also having a digital approval process where once the receipt, the digital receipts are attached to the envelope, then it can go off and be digitally approved by the department head. It can be approved by then the accountant, by the UPM. We have a whole, um, we worked up a matrix of authorizations and approvals so we can get very specified for your own um, company. Because as we know, some people, the accountant's envelopes have to go to the studio so we can make that part of the grid. So it's very nimble with what we can do with that. So we're very excited about that. We've also seen a huge uptick in our ePay, which is our, our electronic um, purchasing card where um, vendors are paid with a uh, virtual MasterCard created for a specific dollar amount. <laughs> So let's say you're gonna pay Coyote, for instance, and they send you an invoice, and um, instead of issuing them a check, you can issue them an e-card for the exact dollar amount, one swipe, pays these invoices. We're seeing a lot of um, an uptick in that. What we noticed in Atlanta, some of the vendors there were very apprehensive about that, but once they started using e-card and they realized that they were getting paid fa excuse me, faster, that they didn't have to go to the mailbox and then bring it back and then write it out and then go deposit it. So they were very much more able to um, embrace that. And last but not least is the one that we're most excited about, which is Cash A Pay. And Cash A Pay introduces AP processing with a digital approval process. So the accounting department, that's eliminating no more cutting checks, routing them for signatures, and then having to mail them. Cache takes on that responsibility. With the Cache Pay service, you send your posted AP batch to Cache. Your team securely logs into our system and approves and releases payments from anywhere in the world 
we have one Netflix show that was on this that uh, the account was in LA, the second signatory was in New York. So instead of having to FedEx things back and forth, he, the UPM could just log in and release the payment. So that's been a big success. And then when we get the payments to process, we either issue an electronic card, a virtual card to make the payment, or we issue a check. The great thing about issuing e-cards is the more e-cards that you are processing for payment vendors, the higher your 1% cash rebate is. So it's a win-win for everybody. So we're very, very excited about Cash A Pay, and we are actually rolling that out in the next couple of weeks to some of our um, clients. That's great, John. I think with, with all of these things, just the way that everyone is all over the world shooting, I think what we save in FedEx alone is going to Oh, my gosh. Be worth it. I could think that FedEx would go out of business or be severely, their um, profit would be grossly um, cut if film industry stopped having to FedEx everything, like, you know, one slip of paper across the, the country. <laughs> 10 separate packages a day of one slip yes. of paper. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, well, I want to ask the panel, as we adjust for the new world, do you feel like there's any gonna, there's gonna be any going back after this? Or are we forging a, a new way that's gonna stick? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, that we're finally going to embrace the cloud now. I, I think it's it's no longer going to be a place just to put things and to retrieve things, but I, I think it's it's going to be a place where most of production can happen. And, and I think we'll, we'll see a, a lot more communication uh, between cloud applications as, as they access this, this common, common pool of production data. I agree with you, Hugh. I, I think people will realize how much power there is in being able to ho house that data. Once you, you have your hands on that data, you can use it for so many other things. And it's so much easier when it's all paperless. You can just retrieve it so much faster. And uh, I, I think this is definitely a great push in the right direction. One thing we've, no we've seen, Julie, is that, um, you know, the old days, all the wire transfers had to go to the studio to sign off on and approve and it would take forever. And now with the, um, the COVID and people needing to be paid quicker, the studio is now kind of loosening the rings of wire transfers and allowing mm. wire transfers to come in and go out. And I think finally, after 30 years, they're finally catching up to it. And I don't think people will go back. I think there'll be a revolt. Yeah, I think they'll be so related. I, mean, I remember in the day when we had to go through 25 pieces of paper just to open a bank account and never have online access. And it was so painful to fight with the people who were wanting to be more progressive and we could not be. So mm -hmm. I'd be very happy about that if I was sitting in a production finance chair right now. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to throw this question. Now we're into our audience questions. I'm going to throw this one out. And this, I don't know if anyone in this particular panel will be able to answer this. And if not, I think two weeks from now, we definitely will be able to answer this. Um, and Michael, you may have the scuttlebutt. Um, there's a lot of talk about the COVID-19 compliance officers that shall be on set. Who mm -hmm. are these people? Who knows them? How are they being trained? Where do you find them? Does anybody know that yet? I don't know. I've, I've gotten a lot of um, a lot of set, you know, sort of medics of like, I don't, I don't even know if there's a, any kind of a certification program, but a lot of the, the set medics are or, or reaching out to us and saying, hey, if you need any, any of this sort of assistance on set, uh, we're here for you. So I don't know who those, but I, certainly there's going to, I imagine these insurance companies are going to demand that, that they have some sort of compliance officer on, on set. And I imagine it might be part of that, the, the set medic. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I imagine insurance companies are going to demand some sort of compliance on set for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure, it feels like a hybrid between a medic and also a production coordinator type. Yeah, Three different moving parts to it. All right, we shall see, and we'll we'll address that in later panels when we have uh, more producers on that are really looking at it deeply. All right, we have a question from Susan. Uh, knowing the budgets are tight in the indie world, counting every single penny. Uh, could each panel member offer some ideas for how safe set concepts can be adapted for ultra low budget productions? Because indies are struggling to be represented in this reopening the industry conversation where it's always like, you add a million dollars to your budget, you'll be just fine. 
I would say that uh, mm. many of the additional equipment they need to buy for the COVID to be in compliance, put it on your cache card and get a 1% cash back. There you go. <laughs> Good plug, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now, the only thing I can maybe all offer all is, um, you know, smaller crews, right? I think, I think with some of this virtual technology, they'll be able to produce more with less on set. You know, so I think you're going to see more, more vir virtual production to the extent they can put prep small crews you know, like like art department comes in for a bit, and then 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 you know lighting and grip comes in, and you know the different departments show up at different times, so maybe they, you know, they can save sort of uh, um, so sort of those day day rates on the different crew members, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think that. Um, the, the sooner you can actually get access to the footage, uh, not just by the onset people, but the whole, your whole supporting team, then the sooner you can head off um, an issue before it becomes a problem. And problems are really expensive. So you know, this, having the immediacy of being able to feedback on what happens on set, I think will allow you to put more money on the screen. Yeah, and one, one benefit that I think will come from this is uh, you know, there's more communication with visual effects on the front end and half the job of visual effects is uh, not, you know, kind of removing our work <laughs> in the project because we're trying to find ways to minimize what we're going to have to do for projects and we can go into it with that mindset and say, okay, if we have a creature project, it can be, you know, millions of dollars for this or here's some tips and tricks that you can do with special effects you can do on set. Um, you know, a great VFX producer and supervisor, they'll work with you to plan that stuff on the front end. I mean, getting an estimate or a budget, that's free. So it's a, you know, hopefully more projects will start thinking about that on the front end and then really trying to figure out, okay, well, actually I can't afford to do this. And here's, you know, I have an expert helping me that maybe they might've been a little hesitant to reach out in the past. Um, you know, maybe they'll reach out and there'll be more collaboration and communication and, and uh, just kind of understanding and, and ways we can innovate and try to meet those budgets. And here at Green Slate, we are always happy to, to have a discussion with you, find out a little bit more about your production and see where we can save you money because we do have different models here um, in terms of payroll. And like I mentioned, a lot of our digital products are already saving you a lot of money on all those storage fees and everything I mentioned earlier. We're also fully integrated with Cache. Um, so if you were gonna use Cache, um, that's right in there with our production accounting system as well. Okay, anyone else on that hot topic? I would say one other thing with some of the smaller crews or maybe even the indies that you know, they might, some of the crew members might have cross functionality, right? Because you're not going to have as many people on set. So you might have a PA doing some gripping or a PA doing some safety compliance or something like that, you know, and, and make sure that you know, combine some of the, uh, the, the, the set functions into, into sort of one role. Because clearly, there, clearly there's not going to be as many people clustered around a camera or on a set. So you got to figure out how to get more out of each individual on that set. And that probably works for non-union, but union jobs will be much tougher. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. That's right. I've also heard of, of people suggesting that their crew that's already there and screened become the extras in behind in the scenes. So we'll see if people start doing that too. Okay, now we have a series of questions from uh, a bunch of people, and they're all around security. So Hugh, uh, is there any worry about piracy if you're sending the dailies to everybody's phone? Yeah, well, it's the, the good thing is that the ability to send secure footage to you know, to phones and to browsers has has kind of already been solved. So, I I don't worry so much about that. Um, you know, I I think I yeah, more more of the risk is um, you know people people on set maybe you know taking photographs of things that they shouldn't. Um, that the secure delivery of video is, is someone that was sold by uh, people much smarter than us <laughs> previously. Okay, yeah. so a non-issue. What about all the um, what about all the accounting paperwork and the IRS documents and the credit card documents? How's how security for everyone? 
Well, I'll say that security is of the utmost importance when it comes to payroll. We're just dealing with sensitive information. We are SOC 2 compliant, which basically means if you're not familiar, we've gone through many, many, many levels of, of security testing. Um, so security is definitely not an issue with us. Same here, we have had to uh, go through all the, um, the regulations to make sure that our, um, everybody's information is securely kept. It's called White Hat. We had to do it for Disney. Everybody just can't have the same one. So we had to do one for Disney, one for Netflix, uh, one for Fox. So we are so locked up, you could never get in. <laughs> no, we very are. We take um, security very seriously. Absolutely. At, uh, at Picture Shop, we have a, it's a tier one uh, TPN certification. So there's the like this thick packet and there's tours and surprise inspections. And I mean, it's just job one, you know, that data and that content has to be secure. It's to everyone's benefit and we take it seriously and there's cameras everywhere. You know, we do everything in our power and everything that we need to, to to check every box um, and there is a benefit because we have a visual effects as well as you know online through finishing where you can do everything in-house which is an added benefit uh, because that data is staying on one server um, so that's something else that you can look for trying to find some efficiencies you're moving data less um, and you're getting things done at one place which can also help right now uh, Carrie I think this is for you Jody is asking if the IRS and the other tax entities are on board with all the digital documents and signatures absolutely we just we make it easy okay the answer is just yes yes uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what honestly we've we've been doing this for so long at Green Slate that we forget that people would that, that people would even worry about things like security and the IRS because we're all about being compliant um, and we've gone through all the testing and so yes the answer is yes <laughs> okay uh, I, there's a couple questions about our our unions on board with actors and other people going on set yet and who's going to be the enforcer of the protocols and I think I'm going to put a pin in those for a later panel when we have a bunch of producers who may be closer to that um, Oh, okay, our grip and light, this might be for you, Michael. Our grip and lighting trucks being adapted in any ways to be able to get gear with less people having to be in the truck or less in and out or side doors or external. How are you dealing with that? Uh, good question. Um, we would basically, like, we haven't done too much with the interior of the trucks other than disinfecting the cabs in the, um, the front and, and, the, and the boxes and all the gear that's going in and out of there. But basically, the gear that comes uh, but it basically it's getting staged in sort of a clean area or the warehouse is a separate area. So uh, we haven't, I don't know that we're, we haven't really thought about the sort of ins and outs of the gear. It's just real about making the, the, the environment safe and disinfected in, the, in which they work. And so, so the gear would come off the truck into this like a, a sort of a safe zone or a clean zone of the warehouse until it gets disinfected then gets back, put back on the shelf um, and sort of tagged as, as ready to go. I don't, we haven't really thought through the sort of the, you know, ins and outs on the truck yet. It's kind of an interesting idea, to, you know, to come in one and go out the other side door, but that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, this this conversation reminds me of the, the last panel when we had Jeanette Volturno on, who was talking about the industry as a whole really has to agree and commit to doing all the protocols because everybody is interacting with each other. Like you have to know wherever you rented your equipment from is as yeah. diligent about the protocols as you are on set and everybody has to be in there and committed and agreed to so that the industry itself can, you know, maintain and be safe. Mm -hmm. You're right. Collaborative before. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, you have a billion questions. Um, or are there a billion questions for you? Uh, we will be providing training in the near future for the Cache Digital Only environment. Oh, you remuted. Oh, and I always make fun of people that do that. I'm sorry. See, it was karma. Um, absolutely. That's one thing that we pride ourselves on is our training programs. So, you know, we usually would travel to people to train them, but now we are all experts in Zoom. So please contact us if you'd like to be set up for a Zoom training class. We have great trainers on board. 
Okay, perfect. I think I'm going to say the same thing for Greenslate. Uh, and then also, how is Cache different than online banking? Where do I start? The biggest thing is with Cache is that when you call, you know, when your people bank with Bank of America or have a B of A card or an Amex card, you're calling people that don't know your business. And here at Cache, we have all been in the production accounting world. So we know what it's like to be on the other side. So we know that you need to get that product as soon as possible. We have built a um, portal that is was built with the um, input of production accountants. So you can see all your transactions in real time. You know exactly where you stand on how much money you have. You get weekly reports. We you know, can customize any report. It's just the, you know, the service and our portal are the two of the biggest things that set us apart from anybody, any of the bank cards out there. And the 1% cash back. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I had one more. So I wanted to tell everybody that we are going to post the information on how to reach all of you on the Catch a Break podcast website. And we'll also post it on the live stream in Facebook so everybody can find everybody. Um, provided you guys don't mind being found, but considering that you're servicing the whole industry, I imagine that you want to be found. So we're going to post all that so everybody can find you. So we're getting to the point in this panel where on the Catch a Break podcast, we call it the martini shot, which as you all know, is the last shot of the day. So even though all of this is hard and all of it is new and all of it is great change, I want to hear what gives you hope right now going forward. Who wants to start with that? Oh, I'll well, I can start. Oh, no, you guys, Sarah. <laughs> you go. <laughs> it's not a grand thing, uh, but I had a friend send me tacos out of the blue. And then uh, we've started, it's sort of random acts of tacos. And uh, we just start, set, just send a random friend tacos. And then they'll do it for someone else. And it's just kind of a, the small bits of, of sanity and kindness and connection that you can find in this quarantine uh, world, I think we're sort of holding on to that. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're able to connect with people that we, we might not have if we were just running through, rushing through a busy day. So kind of a silver lining that I've gotten out of this. <laughs> Random acts of kindness and paying it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you, how about you? Yeah, and, and that kind of feeds into, I, I think, a little bit of what I'm seeing. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, altruism, you know, throughout our industry. Uh, I'm seeing people, you know, reach out and uh, reach out to mentor, mentor to to upskill and to help others um, during these testing times, and, and that fills me with hope. Yeah, I would I would um, sort of further what 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 Hugh and, and Sarah said. Like, we've all been in this sort of this pandemic or this sort of crisis together. So you kind of you've come out of this you like to have a shared experience. So it feels like there's a connection that, that maybe we didn't all have before COVID. So it feels like there's like, there's an opportunity to sort of bring communities together a little bit more around the shared sort of uh, crisis, right? And, you know, we've spent a lot of time, had a lot of time to reflect on our humanity, right? And if you take it just a little bit more of that forward, you know, bring it into our industry, and into our families and our, our communities, um, we should, should be a better place for all, for sure. And I think you're right, and part of it is because we're doing these Zoom calls all the time, everyone's in our living room. Like we've never- <laughs> <laughs> That's true, that's another good point. I mean, Sarah yeah. has the nicest living room we've seen here, um, but it, it, everyone's in your life now. There's the, the line between business and home and family yeah. is- Yeah, yeah, for sure. That is and true. Also, literally life and death like it's so important so I, I what you said really resonates with me okay Carrie go. So I was gonna I'm gonna I gotta say Michael I'm feeling you on your comment about you know how we're all going through this together we're all sort of on the same page and I'm I mean I'm really connecting with all those people who are also gaining weight with me because I am just snacking all the time you know and, and it just reminds us of our humanity and how even though we're all so different it's just we're gonna get this through this together. And I'm yeah. also given hope in this industry in particular, 
because there are so many brilliant minds and so many creatives out there. I've had conversations with people who have been coming up in like really unique ways of shooting from home. And I'm like, wow, really? I would have never yeah. thought of that. And that gives me hope that this industry is going to be okay. I mean, I was reading on Real Screen recently that uh, HGTV just picked up a, a home decor show or a home reno show um, that's completely mm -hmm. being shot in people's homes, self-shot. So I was like, that is amazing. And there's already networks looking to buy shows like that. So that gives me hope. I would, I would say one more thing, because like, it's kind of weird to go through this whole thing about sort of return to production coming out of COVID when we got this Black Lives Matter thing going on that's sort of just trumping this whole COVID thing. I think you take a little bit of that awareness forward with this humanity forward and, and it is a better, better world for sure. So I, we, I, I feel like we need to say something about that here because it's, that's kind of, you know, front and center and COVID sort of taking a back seat. We obviously can't, can't forget that this is like life or death with COVID too, but I, I think those two things combined create an opportunity for, a, a, you know, really communities that, uh, can integrate and had never been together before. Even in our industry, we have an opportunity to sort of, sort of, sort of think about more diverse opportunities, and and um, that 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 needs to be part of the part of the conversation going forward. Absolutely, Michael. Thank you for saying that. I think it's I think it's imperative, and it's a core value, and I, we have to. Yep. Yep. All right, Sean, you get the final word. Well, you know what's so interesting that has really stopped and helped me reflect on the whole world is during the quarantine. I've lived in my same house for 22 years and never knew any of my neighbors. And this has finally stopped all of us to stop and get to know each other and actually help each other. And um, bringing out the, the, the humanity of people that we hadn't seen in so long, especially in this city. And the other thing that really has, um, and it's really connected me to family members that I um, that I lost track of. And now we have Zoom meetings every Sunday night and it's wonderful. But the most important thing is, Madonna was able to take a break and get her knee fixed so she will be back on tour next year. That's what my hope is for. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> 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 that is where we are going to end it for today. I want to thank all of our panelists, Hugh Carvley, Michael Elliott, Carrie Leifat, Sarah McGrail, and John Gillespie. And thank you to Green Slate for being the presenting sponsor of this series. You can find us at gslate.com and also Catch a Break Podcast for producing it. You can find us at catchabreakpodcast.com. You can see the replay of this on Facebook, uh, and we will post it on YouTube in a couple of days. And join us at the same time next week when we're going to talk about the biggest elephant in the room, which is financing insurance and deals with our contributors, Steve Berman of Film Finances, Brian Kingman of Gallagher, Liz Jenkins of Hello Sunshine, Nicole Papenpack of Raider and Feig, and Adrian Ward of the Bank of California. That is going to be a good one and not to be missed. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.